Welcome to our series on social capital. My name is Tristan Claridge and I'm the Director of the Institute for Social Capital and I'm joined by Lyndon Robison, Emeritus Professor of Agricultural and Resource Economics at Michigan State University. Welcome, Lyndon. Thank you, Tristan. It's always good to see you and have the chance to visit and hello to all of those who are joining us online. Uh, Lyndon and I have both been working on the concept of social capital for a long time with Lyndon initially approaching it from economics whereas I came from sociology and social theory. We're both uh, passionate about the concept and our different backgrounds and perspectives make for interesting conversations and engaging debates. In this episode, we'll dig deeper into the core of social capital and what relationships mean. Uh, it's always talked about, and I think just about everyone agrees that uh, relationships and the ways in which we're connected is, is really the core of what social capital is, is all about. So, Lyndon, in a, a previous episode uh, of our podcast, you made the point that relationships matter. Um, why, why do you say that? You know, what's, what's the evidence that relationships matter? Well, thank you. That's a great question to start our uh, podcast off. And if I can be personal for just a second, um, when I was in middle school, I, I didn't have great relationships, and I thought the way to impress um, girls in my class was to insult them or to do something, you know, very, <laughs> that really did the opposite of build a relationship. And somehow someone related to me or advised me uh, to read uh, Dale Carnegie's book on how to win friends and influence people. And so I read it and I was struck by what great suggestions he had for building a relationship. And um, so uh, I applied that. And to some extent, I find my 40 years of research is a lot about rediscovering what Dale Carnegie had to write about. But the point of it is that relationships matter because our well-being um, depends on them. We can't satisfy our commodity needs or even our social emotional needs without relationships. And so uh, I think if if you just reflected for a moment on how your life is influenced by people with whom you have a relationship, you would say, goodness sakes, nearly everything I do is influenced by relationships. It's kind of hard to understand what life would be like without relationships. I mean, it's it's so fundamental to what it means to be human, that we're connected with others, that, that we have social relationships, that we exist within social groupings, and that we interact and exchange with others. Um, it's actually hard to imagine what a human would, would be like if if that did, weren't the case, um, because it's so caught up and interconnected in, in the way that we live our lives. I, I once read about a a, a baby that was lost somewhere and effectively raised by some wild animals uh, and managed to survive till teenage years and then discovered. And so this was effectively a, a human who who wasn't social, who didn't have social relationships with other humans, who who didn't learn language and and uh, socialization and enculturation that that of course all of us do. And they were virtually unrecognizable as a human. You know, the way in which they acted and the way in which they behaved, you would virtually not describe as human. I think that really illustrates how uh, how caught up and interconnected we all are in in our social relationships. Like it's it's impossible to imagine our life without um, the relationships that we have, and that speaks to just how important relationships are. Um, Tristan, before uh, earlier today, I just did a quick. Um... A search on uh, Google about uh, the importance of relationships. And, and I mentioned the book, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People, the 30, over 30 million copies sold. Another book on relationships called The Five Love Languages, 20 million copies sold, 50 languages. Um, and then just an, an incredible long list, Giving the Love You Want by Harville Hendricks, 2 million. Hold Me Tight by Sue Johnson, 1 million. Seven Principles That Make Marriage Work, 1 million. Influencers, nearly all of the business success 
deal with relationships if if we need evidence that relationships matter we simply need to look at what people are writing about and reading yeah that's right and i think all of us are probably familiar with the titles of those books even if we haven't purchased them ourselves so the 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 awareness and the the audience of those books is enormous uh, and it really does like you said it really speaks to the importance of relationships and also perhaps the fact that we appreciate their importance and we want to do better. We want to read a book that helps us to understand relationships and how we can build and strengthen our relationships perhaps uh, more and better. I think the next step is, you know, I don't, I don't think that anyone would disagree that relationships matter. Um, and I think most people would agree that to some extent, when people talk about social capital, they're really referring to some dimension of, uh, of, of a relationship. And um, when we talk about a relationship and we say, well, it's how people are connected, social capital, at least in my understanding, has a very specific um, connection. And it simply means that if we have a relationship, that we don't view, we're not independent of each other's well-being. And so when we say social capital, we're referring to relationships that are connected by dependence, that each other's well-being is interdependent. Yeah, I think that's that's a good way to think about it. And uh, something that I've become much more aware of from our conversations in recent months is that the term relationships is often a, a bit uh, ambiguous as to what we actually mean when we're talking about social capital. And certainly for some theories of social capital, relationships mean means people who know each other, uh, people who have a social relationship with other people who are directly connected through um through being friends or colleagues or family members or, or so forth. But but what a lot of theories of social capital mean by relationships is what we're talking about now, which is that there's some degree of interconnectedness, there's some degree of commonality that we share with these other people. And it may, it may be that we don't actually know them personally. We not, may not recognize their face, we may not know their name, but we still feel connected to them in some way. So we ha have a relationship with them. And then what you're saying, digging into, well, what does that relationship actually mean? And I think that idea of interdependence is exactly what it does mean, is it means that that we feel like we're, we're part of um, their, we're part of them, we're part of their, uh, their life, their social environment, and therefore the things that happen to them in some way affects us and the things that have, uh, happen to us somehow affects them. And that's the, that's what we I think we mean by interdependence. That's how I completely agree with what you're saying. If, if something good happens to you, then somehow I'm made better off. Or if something unfortunate happens, I'm influenced. Otherwise we're completely disconnected. And I would say, our relationship is mostly transactional. So, and what makes your well being, what allows me to, enables me to internalize your well being, we've used words like empathy, sympathy, caring, trust, compassion, and so on. And the question is what would we be like if we didn't, in fact, have social capital? that enabled us to internalize each other's well-being. Why, if it doesn't matter, why are we so interested in it? Why is why are we writing and reading so much? And uh, so can you imagine what life would be like if we didn't internalize each other's well-being? Well, yeah, it's certainly hard to imagine what it would be like. Um, you know, I think if we take a step back for a moment, we can see that most of the theories of social capital uh, understand it to include uh, factors like social norms or, or social trust. 
you know, all these broad social identity, sense of belonging or solidarity. And, and this is with people who we don't necessarily know. So I think these ideas about social relationship or relationships, meaning interconnectedness and connections and the ways in which we're connected, this is consistent with the most theories of social capital, but we, we haven't, I'm not aware of anyone who's really dug into what that means. And that's what we're doing now. And so the idea of interconnectedness is, is clearly important. And the way that you just described it, I think, is as internalizing others' well-being. And like when I think about the first time I heard you say that, I thought, yeah, I can understand how that might be relevant. That might be what we're talking about, but it didn't seem to be quite right to me. I wasn't sure that I really agreed with what you were saying. Like, do I really internalize the well-being of that other person who I'm holding the door open for because it's normatively appropriate to do so, perhaps being the primary reason. And I wasn't sure that I really cared about their well-being, um, to be honest. And then when I thought about it some more, I th and so it's following that train of thought that we're talking about now, that it's relationships are the ways in which we're connected, the ways in which we're interdependent, and therefore, of course, the well-being of other people is is related to my well-being as well. So therefore it is about internalizing other people's well-being. So um, the next step, I suppose, to dig deeper into relationship is what is it that makes our relationships um, or that allows us to internalize each other's well-being? And at least in my mind, it means that we're able to produce and exchange something um, we've called it relational goods that satisfy deep social emotional needs and commodity needs for that matter. And so it is in these relationships that we produce these very valuable goods that allow us to, to satisfy our social emotional needs and to be emotionally healthy people. That um, if we were to sort of isolate people and, and deprive them of exchanges of relational goods, I think we would find evidence that, that we don't do very well, orphans that are neglected and so on. Right. And I, I think like taking that further, you, you asked us before, like, what would it be like if we didn't have social capital? You know, what if we, what if we couldn't exchange relational goods and meet our social emotional needs? And I think the evidence that we're seeing coming out in recent research is that it results in social isolation. Or it results in in depression and uh, mental health problems, and um, and I guess not meeting meeting our social emotional needs also then tends to result in not meeting our commodity needs as well. So it's I think we can understand what it would be like to not have social capital, and it's not good. I think. Perhaps if we were to push, maybe dig one step deeper, it would be to sort of identify perhaps certain relational goods, how they're produced, how they're exchanged, the kind of needs they satisfy. Um, for example, I think we have all experienced or experienced vicariously um, someone performing well or being recognized with a trophy or a certificate or award or, or applause or something um, and recognize how important um, external validation is uh, it, it, as a form of relational goods that helps us say to ourselves, other people approve of what I'm doing and I feel it makes me feel better about myself. Um, or another one would be I'm invited to join or participate in an activity which I share a lot of commonalities with other people and I and I had this need to belong that has resulted that particularly relational good being invited being included and so on I'm better I, I just feel better I feel connected and so on and and then I think we have all had the opportunity of, of finding someone in distress and responding. Um, I was driving to the store the other day, and as 
and I looked to my right, this elderly woman was on the walking on the street and collapsed. And so I pulled the car over and immediately about three or four other people joined. And so there were several of us we checked, helped her uh, establish that she was physically okay and uh, got her where she needed to go. But it was spontaneous. There was no, there was no external reward or penalty. It was just, we saw another person in distress and, and immediately people who were nearby responded. So what we do is, is uh, so much more, so much more uh, complex than we're simply responding to the need to acquire more commodities. And, and that's the example of in, the interconnectedness that we're talking about. That you know, the, clearly there was no existing social relationships there. You, the people who were acting didn't know each other previously. But because of that interdependence, and I guess people's uh, well-being being interdependent, I want to explore that idea of, of interdependent well-being. That people took action and they got involved. And when you think about what happens, is because you stopped and acted, you felt good and you received relational goods or whatever you want to think about it, it was a good outcome for you. It was a positive experience and, and something that you would, I'm sure, do again. Uh, she also felt good because someone stopped to assist and obviously there was other benefits there as well. So although as a, I'm not an economist and we've talked about language before that we use different language, and but it's an exchange. I can understand it as an exchange of relational goods that you felt good and she felt good and good things occurred as a result of these, these actions that took place. And that does represent internalizing other people's well-being because of that interdependence that we experienced with people who we who you didn't know, with effectively with strangers, but you still felt connected with and had that relationship with in in terms of the ways in which we connected. And I'd be interested what that the nature of that connection was. It may have been simply that you you're both members of the same community or same society or whatever whatever the reasons that that you feel connected you. Uh, and there could be various reasons why you felt connected. One there is a relationship that perhaps we could mention, and that is our relationship with our ideal self that has been formed by the examples of others, reinforcements in the past, <clears throat> our culture perhaps. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. at least I think I have defined in my mind or, or whatever, wherever it's <laughs> defined of what right behavior is as a person, as a member of, as a human. And um, that person says, if you see someone in distress, you should act. Now, maybe in other communities, you would say, well, that is a very dangerous uh, uh, action. You, you know, there could be lawsuits and so on. But I think we all kind of define for ourselves what is self-validating behavior and when possible, and, and of course there are conflicts, we try and act to to win the approval of our ideal self. Some some people might call that a conscience, but um, but nevertheless, we are uh, we do try and and win internal validation when possible. And I think a lot of people would talk about this as being uh, our actions aligning with our values, or perhaps yep. our moral values. And what we think is right and wrong to do in a particular situation. But I think this this still does come down to the way in which we're connected, because the way in which we define our values is is largely socially defined. Like you made mm -hmm. the point that in a particular uh, society or community, you it may not be appropriate to stop an act. And part of the reason may be because you might get into legal trouble if you if you did and did the wrong thing or something. Um, so, so the value system is is some is quite extensively defined by our social grouping and the way in which we're connected to others. So, so I think these are the, the core points of what what social capital is about: is this idea of of relationships and what we mean by relationships really is the ways in which we're connected and interconnected and interdependent on on other people in our social groupings. Agreed, very much so. 
Uh, Tristan, you and I had a conversation on uh, your podcast uh, some time ago about um, looking at relationships, perhaps in a more uh, more more complicated way, looking at triads as opposed to binary relationships, and um, and so the you know when we think about social capital, uh, while while it's often more convenient and easier to describe in one-on-one -on -one relationships. Um, most of our, or a lot of mine uh, experiences at least involve more than one relationship simultaneously. I, you know, as, as a parent raising children and trying to be a peacemaker or a broker um, and feeling uh, the pressures of social capital relationships or, or, or in more complicated, um, where where you have asymmetric relationships, there's a lot to be learned about how we manage social capital in more complex social settings. Yeah, I completely agree, and it's it's the idea I think as well that the, we're always um, part of of multiple social social groupings at the same time. You know, we might be. Part of our family but also part of our neighborhood but also part of our, our particular uh, business or employment environment and potentially other interest groups and and so forth and these don't always align in terms of um, the the nature of those connections the nature of that connectedness don't always align you know we might have certain um, you know feelings and beliefs and attitudes towards our family members but they may also be members of an organization and so you end up with different and complex kinds of relationships going on. I think that's taking it a little further than what what you were just talking about in terms of triads. But it's it's the same kind of idea that we, any one relationship or any one form of connection doesn't exist in isolation from the other connections that exist around you. And we where those more complex relationships become um, evident is in international relationships where. You have country A wanting to maintain a relationship with country B, um, and uh, but and B wanting to maintain a relationship with C, but then countries A and C are um, don't like each other or are fighting. For example, you can think of China and Russia and the United States or Hungary and Russia and and uh, the European Union, uh, you know, you just don't have to look very far to see sort of complicated relationships that involve social capital, but they involve more than two players. Yeah, and it also speaks to the interdependence that we've been talking about in this episode as well, that, you know, the consideration of different countries to to try to negotiate and accommodate other countries needs uh, speaks to the inter interdependence that we all have um, you know you, in inter international diplomacy the, you can't treat one relationship in isolation from the, the other interdependent relationships that exist with other countries so it's, it's it, it speaks to what we really mean by relationships being that inter interconnected and interdependent nature absolutely and so it wherever we see a conflict we can see um, some party in, in the current situation in Gaza and Israel, uh, parties that that are trying to use, perhaps the United States, trying to use its goodwill with uh, hopefully Gaza and Israel to bring about some kind of moderated outcome. But these roles of brokers and peacemakers are how we effectively try to use our social capital, or you have a party that has influence, has relationship with two conflicting or separated parties to bring them together. And so there is a role, I think, for social capital in multiple spheres, but one of them would be in the policy arena of how we can use our social capital to reduce conflicts. 
Yeah, I agree. I think we, we need to dedicate an episode in, in the near future to this topic to explore it in a bit more detail. But uh, we've run out of time for this one. I think it was really worthwhile to to reconnect and dig a bit deeper into the idea of, of relationships and the core of what social capital is all about. So as always, Lyndon, it's been great talking with you. and I look forward to the next one. Equally, uh, Tristan, good to see you. And thank you to all those that have joined us online. We look forward to another episode.